All right, so this is uh, Mark and Sharif for uh, the first edition of um, How to Sound Great at Parties. And the topic for today's podcast is going to be aging. Sharif, no. tell me something I don't know about aging. Well, first of all, some, some, somebody that's listening to this might think, I don't think I'll sound cool at a party if I start talking about aging. But you just got to bear with us, all right? Because you're going to find out some pretty cool stuff. That's <laughs> all your friends. Um, right. Aging. Yeah. Um, so aging is something that happens in most, uh, most creatures. And I say most because it doesn't include things like Hydra, which is like a little species of freshwater, basically pond scum. <laughs> <laughs> For there's like a jellyfish that doesn't age either. They just like replicates itself endlessly. That might well be true. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So, so some creatures are immortal basically, which sounds pretty cool. It kind of also depends on what you define as immortal because strawberry plants, for instance, they produce endless clones and clones of themselves. Mm. So that kind of depends on whether you think that means you're immortal or not. Mm. Interesting. What do you think? No, because I think in order to be like properly immortal, you would need to, it wouldn't be about replicating yourself. It'd be about keeping what you have like permanent, like infinite. I don't know. In, in a way, if you produce a clone of yourself, then that's keeping what you have. Isn't it creating like a younger version of yourself, though, basically? Like starting from scratch from the same material, which I guess if you keep doing that, you could call yourself immortal. But I have more the idea of like how to remain timeless. It probably depends on whether you're a human or something like a plant, because obviously... <laughs> <laughs> for all of our plant <laughs> listeners out there, <laughs> yeah, this is for you. <laughs> send us what you think on the matter, you know, <laughs> send us your two cents. So obviously as humans, we have consciousness, right? Mm. Which we don't know, but I, what we think that if we make a clone, that th that human won't have the same consciousness, won't have the same memories mm. as what the original might have. Although then again, we don't know because we've never tried. Okay. Plants, obviously don't have the same complex uh, brains as us. And I don't mean to be plantist here, uh, <laughs> but you know, we, we don't know whether for, for a plant that would be being immortal or not. Mm. But anyway, we're talking about aging, not immortality. Um, so aging uh, in humans is what we're going to kind of mainly keep <laughs> <with>. <laughs> uh, is, is usually it's been, it, there's a number of mechanisms that we know lead to aging and we're fairly certain that it includes basically damage to your DNA, right? Which is basically the building blocks, um, that are inside our cells and they lead to proteins being made from them. And that's basically how we live, uh, to grossly simplify it. Now, many things affect how fast we age. Or how slow we age. What do you think, Mark? What, what kind of things would, would influence aging? Well, anything that would affect... That's the thing, though. I wouldn't have thought, just like, based on my extremely extensive like medical <laughs> knowledge, <laughs> that DNA is something that could be affected or damaged. Like, you would think that, you know, you have your chromosomes, you have your DNA, that's what it is in all of the cells of your body. And like, that's relatively permanent. Is it the actual DNA that changes? Yeah. So DNA changes with, with time, um, through a number of mechanisms. Mm. Uh, we don't know fully how, but some ways that it changes is just generally wear and tear and, uh, everything in the body wears and tears, including DNA. And some of the ways that that happens is for instance, when you replicate a cell, so we're constantly replicating our cells. Some cells replicate and have to replicate much faster than others. For example, the lining of our stomachs gets renewed completely every three to four days. So every single cell in that lining is a different cell from three to four days ago. Mm -hmm. And that has to happen because so much digestive stuff moves through there that it just gets damaged mm -hmm. and you just have to keep renewing it. Now, replicating a cell causes mutations just that's, that's just how dna works it causes mutations and mutations can be good or bad you know uh, mutations uh can lead to cancer 
with, with time, mm -hmm. usually multiple mutations. But mutations can also lead to uh, interesting things. Um, and I'm not talking X-Men kind of mutations here, although you never know. Over. <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> yeah. But then, so you're saying then that, you know, the idea that all the cell, all the cells in like a human's body have the same like genome, the same genetic code. That's not true then, because some of them are being degraded and end up mutating. So you actually have the chromosome makeup that's like in the nucleus of every cell isn't necessarily 100% the same for all the cells. Because of this wear and tear. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And that's why you can end up getting, for example, uh, let's say b uh, bone cancer or prostate cancer, because mm, okay. the damage there has led to cancer building. Okay. But anyway, so far, yeah. yeah. So just some general interesting facts about aging. Uh, the world population is aging very rapidly. So right now, the number of people that are 60 and over in the world make up about 12% of the population. But apparently by 2050, that'll be 22%. That's almost a quarter of people will be 60 and over. Yeah. It's quite a big, quite a big change, what do you think? Yeah. Now, tied in with that, it also means, uh, these are predictions done by the WHO, that the number of people that will need assistance with their activities of daily life, mm -hmm. and by activities of daily life, I mean things like washing yourself, dressing yourself, eating, preparing right. food. The number of people that will need assistance with that is also going to climb a lot. So it's actually going to likely be a fourfold in 2050 compared mm -hmm. to now. Yeah. I'm just thinking that it's like, it's not so much about preserving our ability to like preserving the length of our lives. It's like, how can we preserve youth? Very good question. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very, that's a very good point. So there's this really cool book called the telomere effect mm -hmm. by this lady called Elizabeth Blackburn. She's a Nobel prize winner uh, for the work that she did. Uh, it's, it's, basically about telomeres, which are interesting little things. So the best way so the best way to explain it, I think, is to borrow one of her analogies. She basically compares the, the DNA in our cells to a big shoelace. This whole shoelace contains lots and lots and lots of DNA. Mm. Yeah. And at the end of the shoelaces, just like at the end of the shoelaces on your shoes, you have these little protective things. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Those yeah, like little plastic things. Yeah, yeah that's cover. Yeah. exactly. So apparently those are called aglets. Mm. I didn't even know they had a name. <laughs> <laughs> that's the actual lace version. Now in our DNA, those those things are called telomeres. I thought you could, they were called aglets in the cell. Uh, <laughs> no, they're actually called aglets. If you look at, <laughs> no you look at your shoes, your, those things are called aglets. There you go. I learned something today. And, <laughs> yeah. So the DNA version of aglets are called telomeres. Got it. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, telomeres have the same function as aglets in the sense that they protect the ends of the DNA. They stop it from fraying. So, if you've ever lost an aglet from one of your shoelaces, you'll notice that your shoelace starts to fray quite a lot and kind of yeah. disband and goes to shit, basically. Yeah. So <laughs> that's what that's kind of what happens with DNA. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. Now, telomeres. Everybody's born with a certain telomere length. And the longer the telomeres are, the better. Yeah. Generally. More protection they'll Yeah, more protection. Or the longer they last. That's another thing, yeah. So so telomeres shorten with age. Okay. And there are certain things that shorten it more than other things. And there's certain things that can even make your telomeres build back up again a little bit. All right. So Go a lot on. of this research yeah, I'm interested. You're intrigued. So a lot of this research that she's doing is on telomeres. Okay. And we found telomeres as far as we know are one of the best indications of cellular aging that we know of today. Mm, okay. Some interesting, surprising factors that influence telomeres, which I was quite surprised about, are having a greener house. So having more plants in your house is linked to longer telomeres. Okay. Interesting. I found that quite surprising. It, yeah. I mean, do we, do we know what the underlying reason for that is? So most likely it's just the fact that plants filter air right okay. they they produce more oxygen and they make it from carbon dioxide i was definitely reading way much more into that <laughs> it's like ah yes plants produce air yes i forgot about that well one. yeah <laughs> yeah the, i mean that's one thing i don't know the, the specifics but 
they do influence telomeres. May, but that's the thing, it's difficult with these experiments because maybe the types of people that would consider buying plants mm -hmm. and putting them in their house yeah. are people that have different lifestyles. Yeah. Okay. The people that wouldn't get plants, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's so it's plants, difficult. It's yeah, maybe. We don't know. We don't know. I mean, <laughs> I like to think it's the plants. I like to think it's, it's the plants. Solution. Well. <laughs> Clearly, got a magical aura that <laughs> exudes youthfulness. Yeah. Uh, another one is the, the the response that you show in according um, in response to uh, you know shocking things that happen in your life. Okay. So some people have a high threat response, so they respond to things in a very threatened way let's say you're walking on the street and okay. you hear a loud bang yeah if you get very shocked by that and you kind of have a threat response by that we mean your heart rate goes up a lot you know you're you're your, psychologically your you're like oh what's going on you're shortened just a little bit every time <laughs> every time you hear a loud bang <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um the types of people that do better are those that have a bring it on mentality okay and that's not just to any threat that's generally to stress as well yeah um, and there's a really interesting TED talk, if anybody wants to know more about this, by a lady called Kelly McGonagall. And the talk is called uh, Make Stress Your Friend, How to Make Stress mm. Your Friend, something like that. And she cites the study done in the US with like 30,000 people, it's a big study. Uh, and all these people obviously had stress, like any person <laughs> does. <laughs> and they decided to see how people respond to stress, depending on how high or low the levels of stress were. What they found out is actually having less stress isn't really better for you. It's just the processing. Right? It's yeah, it's exactly. It's your attitude towards stress. Yeah. So if you see stress as a kind of thing that is a challenge for you and you're going to go up and rise up to the challenge and you actually respond better to it and your telomeres respond better. Mm. So it's all about the mindset. True. But how easily is that? I mean, it's like anything else, right? How easy is it to cultivate that kind of mindset? Yeah. Are people genetically predisposed to being for sure. like much more stressed out for generally? Sure. And if you're one of those people, then can you even develop a mindset where you mitigate these effects? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You can change it. It mm -hmm. takes time, yeah. um, but it's possible. I, I'm no, I'm no psychologist, but uh, it, it's definitely supposed to be possible. Mm -hmm. Now, Aging, you mentioned genetics there. So aging in general also has a large genetic component to it. Okay. So whether you get your, your chances of getting heart disease, your chances of getting uh, certain types of cancer, you know, yeah. are definitely influenced by genes. Sure. Um, but the environmental factors also come into it a lot. Yeah. So these are some of the things. So obviously, you can't change your genes. Well, not, not yet. yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Um, but these are the things that we're discussing, the kind of environmental factors that you can play with. Uh, so another one, which actually I thought was pretty cool, is your attitude towards aging itself okay. influences how you age. That's so meta. Like, yeah. <laughs> how do the telomeres know? <laughs> They're self-aware. <laughs> They'll take over the world. Um, so there's a really cool quote, which is... Um, Aging is like mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. Mm. That was pretty cool. Yeah, no, it makes sense. You're going to get a tattoo of that, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chinese characters with that <laughs> on my shoulder. Anyway, these are the kind of things that can make you sound cool at a party, right? I guess. I mean, it depends on the kind of party that you go to. <laughs> I know. The thing about, I mean, I'm so sad I've already forgotten. What's the name of the telomeres for your shoelaces <laughs> aglets aglets <laughs> if there's anything i'm going to take away from this session it's the aglets <laughs> yeah i don't know i feel like i feel like my friends would be interested in kind of hearing about these things at parties but yeah maybe that just means that my friends are dweebs no and no. you're one of them no definitely <laughs> i'm just thinking like you know i guess maybe this is something we can talk about next time but like how then to develop this kind of mental mm. attitude yeah. that helps you process stress, helps you deal with yeah. the stress of aging yeah. better in a way that actually keeps your telomeres nice and turgid. <laughs> Don't ask me too much about that now because I, I'd have to definitely do a bit of research. <laughs> that one. But uh, anyway, moving swiftly on. Um, so another one that influences how fast you age is uh, hot dogs. <laughs> Go on. So, uh, this is 
uh, and I don't mean eat more hot dogs. I mean eat less hot dogs. <laughs> Because hot dogs are I really a saw it going and... another way. I'm really sad. <laughs> <I wish. laughs> um, yeah, you were getting excited. Yeah, Saliva like, started to drool. Yes. <laughs> hot dogs are the solution. <laughs> no, so obviously hot dogs are an example of processed foods, mm, okay. uh, specifically processed meats. And processed meats are uh, a nightmare for telomeres. Mm. Uh, obviously, other things are, I guess, things like hamburgers, uh, forms of minced meat, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So the more natural it is, the better. Uh, that links in nicely to food. So generally with food, the less processed something is, yeah. the better it is for you. So so we think of something that's very highly processed. Oh, like minced meat is a yeah. perfect example yeah. of that. Yeah. Or like cornflakes. Cornflakes. I mean, some of them can be very healthy, actually. Yeah. Um, but generally, they're quite highly processed foods that are very high in sugar. So the less processed, the better. Um and then there's something else about foods. So generally, the kind of foods that are better for your aging, for your mm. telomeres, are foods that don't raise your blood sugar very fast. Mm. So they're like slow releasers mm. of sugar. And uh, the scientific term for that is glycemic index, GI. Mm. So you want foods with a low GI, which means they don't raise your sugar as fast. Okay. So examples of that are things like uh, whole wheat bread, you know, yeah. or whole wheat pasta, mm -hmm. things like seeds, nuts, uh, bran, anything that's kind of whole grain, you know. And the opposite of that is white bread, for instance, will raise your blood sugar much faster than brown bread will do. Okay. So that's not a good, not a good one to go for. Yeah. Sweets are obviously a prime example. Anything like candy do, has a very high GI. Do we know how, like, for example, something like food actually affects the telomeres, though? Is it... A case that these things produce, let's say, a chemical or a substance that like physically erodes mm. the telomeres, or does it work in a more indirect way? Right. As far as I know, so just generally raising your blood sugar fast yeah. is what these foods do, yeah. and your body just hates that. Uh, long term, that leads to uh, things like diabetes. Yeah. If you frequently eat foods that cause a high spike in your blood sugars. Um, I definitely need to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's right. You can't, you can't see any. Uh, you, you look pretty healthy to me, Mark. That's true. <laughs> I have such a sweet tooth. I definitely <laughs> need to keep that, like, bring that in. Um, and also things that are high in fiber. So an example, very good example here is fruits. So fruits generally have a, quite a high GI. So mm -hmm. they raise your blood sugars quite fast. But they are also high in fiber, which... Fiber basically slow, kind of acts also kind of slow down a little bit how fast the sugar is released. Okay. So that's why fruits themselves, if you eat fruits as they are, they're pretty good for you. But if you eat, if you drink fruit juices, they basically have all the fiber stripped of them. Got so it. they raise your blood sugar really fast. So OJ maybe isn't the best, mm -hmm. whereas an orange is much would be much better for you. Yeah. I also wonder, like. You know, when we talk about processed foods, like, what is it about the, does all processing effectively remove good aspects of food? Like, I think, like, I feel like just processing is such a blanket term. Mm. It covers so many things for so many different types of food. Like, yeah. is, like, processed fruit, which would be a fruit juice, as bad as, like, processed meat? Like, what does the processing process involve so that it actually strips so much of the mm. goodness away from food? I don't know all the examples, but I guess if you obviously if you process fruit in the sense that you remove fiber, we know that that's the way it, it's bad for you because it raises your blood sugars that fast. Mm. Uh, the thing with meat, actually, I don't know. I think generally processing involves introducing a lot of chemicals yeah. into into things. Mm. Um, so if you look at a burger, yeah, it might be made of beef. <laughs> it might be. Ingredients. If you're really fucking lucky. <laughs> it depends where you live. <laughs> Uh, it's. It, I mean, okay, it is made of meat. <laughs> Screw you, Mark. Um, but if you look at the ingredients for a burger, it'll also include things like preservatives. Yeah, yeah you know. Of course. So yeah. processing generally involves injuries and in chemicals, which is not good for you. So it's more about like the bad stuff that they put in, as opposed to anything they remove, or both, or both, presumably. Yeah, yeah. Right. So that's foods for you. Uh, also, generally, foods the, uh, the the way the reason that certain foods are better for you, especially uh, vegetables, mm -hmm. and specifically vegetables that have deep, rich hues to them. 
So yeah. the kind of the richer in color and the darker they are, the better. So something like a blueberry, yeah. you know, it's quite rich and dark. Yeah. Um, something that will be is a very light green, like celery, mm. might not be as good. It's so good. Okay. Um, and the reason is because uh, the more deeper in colors they have, uh, generally, the better antioxidants they are. Mm. So antioxidants <laughs> basically combat ox oxidizing chemicals and uh, oxidizing chemicals when they are in your in your body they basically wreak havoc mm. because they just damage your dna mm. and antioxidants act act to kind of take those out of your system okay yeah no i'd always heard about antioxidants being good for you but i never understood exactly why yeah but then it all comes down back to the telomeres then yeah, yeah. Helps yeah. Preserve. oh yeah well, i mean telomeres aren't the only thing but telomeres have been shown to reduce faster when you have more oxidizing mm. kind of chemicals in you interesting before we continue, anything that you are wondering about that might affect your aging? No, yeah, because I was wondering, like, I guess it comes down to two things. It's just like the lifestyle and the mentality, right? So we've talked a little bit about the mentality. I think that's like a separate thing that we mm. can talk about another time. Yeah. But I don't know. I feel like in today's today's society, which is so like, fast moving in every sense of the word means that we eat a lot more processed food and all that sort of thing. Like that's obviously, well, not obviously, but very likely to contribute to our aging in a negative way. What other aspects of like lifestyle, like sleep or anything else or exercise, yeah, what do yeah. those things, how do sure. they affect yeah. the process? So these also affect telomeres. Uh, so first of you mentioned sleep. Sleeping is very important. For sure it affects telomeres, for sure it affects aging. Um, Kind of, there's lots of different numbers out there, but generally the consensus seems to be six to eight hours um, or six and a half to eight hours, something like that is generally what people see to, see to be as the ideal sleep length. Mm -hmm. But what we didn't know beforehand, what was kind of, there's becoming more of an emphasis on that nowadays, is that it's not all just about sleep length. A lot of it is about sleep hygiene. Okay. So sleep hygiene is how the, well you sleep. how well you sleep. Yeah. And that's influenced by many things. One of them is uh, try looking, try stop looking at screens about mm -hmm. an hour or at least or longer than that if possible yeah. before you go to bed. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is uh, screens generally emit quite a blue light. Yeah. And uh, compared to, I don't know, let's say other types of light. I mean, light is a spectrum mm -hmm. uh, ranging from blue to red, basically. And screens lean more towards the blue side. And blue light is very good at affecting your body clock, the yeah. clock that's inside your body. This body clock has tendrils that run into every aspect of your being. Yeah. Things like your metabolism, your sense of hunger, your sense of sleep. Yeah. Blue, blue light delays your clock. So if you start looking at, so generally, the, the, the kind of the way that light affects your clock is perfect. Yeah. Because you wake up in the morning, the sun is bright, it resets your body clock, so your body clock knows, okay, this is the time to wake up, this is the time to kickstart all the organs, kickstart the metabolism. Yeah. If you look at blue light just before going to bed. It's like tricking your body and thinking yeah. the day is longer than it is. Yeah, yeah. It, it messes with you, you know? So um, sleep hygiene and sleep length are very important. Now, exercise you mentioned. Exercise is perfect for avoiding the classic midlife trifecta of stress, belly weight gain, mm -hmm. and high blood sugars. Yeah. So exercise is really good at combating that, mm. uh, and particularly, it's, all, it's obviously it's also good for telomeres. And the two kinds of exercise that are found to be pretty good for your telomeres, so for your aging generally, is one moderate cardiovascular exercise. Mm. And by moderate, I mean something like sixty percent intensity, so yeah. sixty percent of your your max capacity, let's say. Uh, and sixty percent for most people will mean enough that they are kind of panting, yeah. but they can still just about hold a conversation with somebody. <laughs> so let's say you're jogging, you yeah. know, it's enough that you feel short of breath and you're panting, but I can still talk to you. Okay. You know? That's 60%. That's a good measure, actually. Yeah. Doing that for about 45 minutes a day, yeah. uh, three times a week, is kind of a good number. Now, if you want to do more than that, it, it's it's the, the benefits are going to build up. Okay. But that's a good target to aim for. Mm. That's one kind. The other kind is something called HIIT or HIT, yeah. which stands for High Intensity Interval Training. Yeah. 
what that involves is doing high intensity exercise for shorter periods of time, then having a little rest and then doing it again, right? And repeating that. So doing, let's say two or three cycles of high intensity. So when I say high intensity, I mean 80%. So 80% of intensity or 90% up to 90% of your maximum heart rate. Yeah. Um, at this, at this, at this speed, you can't hold a conversation with anybody. <laughs> um, so those are the two kind of main, main types of exercise that okay. are there. Yeah. Makes sense. Another one that I found interesting is conscientiousness. Okay. That one's also good for telomeres. Conscientiousness or the, the, the doing, wishing to your duty well or thoroughly, wishing to do your work well or thoroughly mm -hmm. uh, has a positive effect on telomeres. And generally, conscientiousness involves impulse control mm -hmm. as well. So being able to resist impulses like uh, looking at your phone all the time yeah. or you know, being able to focus on a task, being conscientious is pretty good. Interesting. Because you would think that in some ways being very conscientious is a kind of like obsessiveness that can, that can spring from or generate stress. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say you're working on a particularly tough task at work. If you want to be super conscientious about it, you'll like dedicate your heart and soul to it. But in the meantime, probably generate a lot of stress for yourself. I don't know. I think maybe there's a, there has to be a way of doing it in a way that is just like purely positive and not stress building, but that must be quite difficult to do as well. I do feel like people that have low conscientiousness might go home after a day's work, maybe with some little feelings of guilt. If they know that they could have done their job better, you know, if they're not very conscientious, they know that they've been distracted a lot, that they haven't put in as much as they probably could do. Mm -hmm. And that feeling of guilt might also then affect, you know, your telomeres generally. It might, it might cause, cause like a little bit of background chronic stress, knowing that you're not, mm -hmm. you're not doing what you, what you should be and could be doing. I don't know. I feel like someone who's not particularly conscientious also wouldn't feel too guilty about not having done a good job. Whereas the conscientious person might go home, despite having done a good job, still feeling like they could have done more. Mm -hmm. And that, that's like needless stress. I guess there's probably for themselves. Yeah, there's probably a spectrum of con conscientiousness and kind of obsessiveness, mm. and it uh, will be good to be towards the side of conscientious rather than obsessive, obviously. Yeah, but I guess there's a fine line between them. Yeah. Right. So, speaking of stress, so as we said, your your approach to stress is very important. Mm. But generally, the, the there is a kind of stress that will age you quite fast and that is chronic stress okay high kind of lots and lots of chronic stress that doesn't just doesn't abate you know um and the the people that experience this a lot are caregivers full-time caregivers okay so let's say uh, a mother that has a child that has a disability mm. that means that the mother ends up being a full-time carer yeah and maybe even also have a job yeah those people experience extremely high levels of chronic stress and that has been shown to really wreak havoc with your telomeres. Yeah. So these women, as a, these women have been used in studies quite a lot mm -hmm. and looking at the telomere length, they have lot, much shorter telomeres than mothers that aren't full-time caregivers, let's say for their children. Yeah. I mean, it just makes you ask, right? Like, what do you do in that scenario? Mm -hmm. Because the, the stress is just like, it's another word for like, they're always worried mm. because they're a caregiver. They're conscious of the person that they're caring for needs to be cared mm. constantly. Mm. And that if they're not receiving that, that's just worry. And that's mm. just stress. Yeah. It's hard to think of ways that you could try to mitigate that. Mm. And especially if like, let's say, um, let's say we're not talking about a parent. Let's say we're talking about someone whose job it is to do this, like who is a caregiver for an elderly person or a child or something like that they are pretty much consciously subjecting themselves to this kind of situation where they will feel chronic stress all the time. Yeah. The other issue with it is that these people often find it difficult to do things for themselves. Like, I don't know, go to the gym, you know, yeah. who's going to take care of little Johnny, you know, when I'm at the gym, yeah. you know, or 
even if they're there and somebody else is caring for them, they might be worried that that carer, that substitute carer, isn't doing the right job. Maybe yeah. John is going to be the stress that his mom isn't there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So in just many ways, it's just not nice. <laughs> so um, we've spoken about quite a few factors. And uh, although I have heard somebody say that the best way to slow the process of aging is to try and put it through the House of Commons. <laughs> <laughs> Solution. Solution found. Okay, yeah. uh, so another one, which I found interesting, is something called social cohesion. Okay. So neighborhoods that I know, are... I think I know what you're getting at, yeah. Go on. What do, you, what do you reckon? Well, it's like people who live in a... who have like a living scenario where they feel a stronger sense of belonging, of community, and that sort of thing will like they age while well, they don't suffer from the negative consequences of aging as acutely as someone who is like very alienated or atomized in the world, the way that they live. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So if you live in a neighborhood where you and your neighbors know each other, kind of can trust each other, yeah. that has a good impact on your, on your telomeres. And this is true no matter what income group you belong to. Sure. So even if you're, uh, some rich dude living in an area where all the houses are amazing, but you don't know your neighbors. Yeah, that is not going to be good for you. You're going to no, age. You're going to hundred miles you, an you, hour. You age over. <laughs> <laughs> you might have a Ferrari, but you're going to age even faster you're, than that Ferrari. <laughs> then it can drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So those are some interesting ones uh, that I found. Now you also mentioned life can go quite fast in, in our society, which is true. And there's so many distractions, yeah. but something that's also really good for maintaining your telomeres is being able to focus on the task at hand. Yeah. That's also really good. So not being distracted by other things and just being able to do one thing at a time. It's pretty good. I know. It's one of the hardest things to do as well. Like particularly at work, it's just, you feel that by multitasking, you're achieving so much more. But I can, I've been like, I can see myself when I will start to do, start a task and I see an opportunity to move to another one, mm. I will move on to the next task, even before finishing the previous one, even if it's as short as like writing an email or something. If I'm in the middle of that and I get a message from elsewhere, I'll switch over to the next one. Yeah. And you just know that it's having a negative effect. I'd like... You could you can call it aging for sure, but just like on your attention span, on your like mental health levels of stress, yeah. all that sort of thing, it's terrible. But it feels like it's something that modern society, modern workplaces, and all that it almost demands that. Yeah, it's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel it's very pervasive. Yeah, you're right. Now, some of you, and I mean, also some of the other important things that influence aging are things like. Smoking, alcohol, obviously have bad effects. They yeah. make you age faster. And some of you may think, okay, so I can't have hot dogs. I can't have alcohol. I can't have a smoke. Screw it. Like, I'd rather live fast, die young, that yeah. kind of thing. Now, the problem with that kind of thinking is that... <laughs> is you won't live fast and die young? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, actually, not necessarily. You might, you, you might live fast, but you might not die young. And what I mean by that is you might have a long period of disease span yeah so the reason why all this the, the reason why telomeres are so important as well is not just because uh you age slower which is true it also means that you spend less time in a disease span and more time in the health span so mm -hmm. let's say somebody lives 80 years yeah yeah the ideal kind of solution the ideal kind of living would be to live healthily for 79 of those years or even more yeah and and only have a short period of illness at the end that yeah. would make you eventually pass away mm -hmm. that is for many people uh, much better than living for 40 years, you know, in good health and 40 years in bad health and yeah. then, you know, being confined to a bed for the last 10 years of your life. Yeah. So telomeres and these kind of, all these factors we're discussing will put that kind of prolong your health yeah. span. So unless you do it so badly that you'd like kill yourself, <laughs> you will just end up in this like terrible midway situation yeah, where you're like limbo. sick for forever yeah. so and, if it, and, and getting old anyway. <laughs> So if you're gonna if you're gonna drink alcohol, you should drink <laughs> alcohol <laughs> or not at all. <laughs> or not at all. <laughs> Basically, like do either do it well or don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Now, there are some interesting areas in the world that scientists have been quite interested in. Mm. Uh, and the reason they've been interested in these places is that these places have a, a high number of centenarians, which means people that reach into the hundreds. Yeah. You know, well, I say hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the hundreds. Like, whoa, <laughs> these people I did not know about. Um, so, no, I think the oldest recorded person is 122, was 122 years old. And it passed away in 1990, I think, mm. as far as I know. Um, so, these areas are three that I know of. One is in Japan, mm. it's the remote island of Okinawa, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah. And scientists have been trying to find out why these people live so long, generally, and they're very healthy, you know, um, kind of much healthier than even the rest of Japan, even though Japan is a very healthy country in general. Yeah. And one of the things that these people practice is called harahachibu, which uh, is, is practiced in Japan widely as well, but especially in this area. And this concept involves stopping, kind of stopping what you're eating when you're 80% full. Okay. So I don't know about you, but if I have like a full plate of food and I kind of eat the whole plate, I might feel okay when I've just finished, but afterwards I might feel kind of over full. Have you ever had that? Oh yeah, all the time. And yeah. it's something that I've even managed to catch now as I'm going on. So I will almost stop eating occasionally when I'm like, when I feel 60% full, because I know that in 20 minutes time, mm. I'm going to feel 80% full, yeah. which is actually the optimal yeah. stage. So obviously not able to do it all the time. Yeah. If you put a big ass pizza in front of me, <laughs> I will probably <laughs> finish the whole thing and, and, and regret it. <laughs> but I know what you mean. Cry yourself to and sleep. They, <laughs> and they do, and obviously they must do it then very consciously, mm. very regularly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's very cool what you're describing, this 20 minute period. Yeah. Um, and it can be explained by science. It's the it's the signals that your stomach is sending to your brain, yeah, right? Exactly. It's like twenty minutes to get there. Yeah, mm. yeah. So you've got you've got these two hormones. One's called leptin, which is the, um, the kind of the, the satiety hormone, mm. and one's called ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone. And ghrelin is kind of put into your bloodstream from your stomach. Your stomach is what releases it, and what stops it being released is when your stomach gets stretched. Yeah. Now, ghrelin's, when your stomach stops getting stretched, or when your stomach gets stretched, obviously when you're eating and yeah. you know, you're starting to get pretty full, your body will stop secreting ghrelin gradually. But there's already ghrelin in your blood, and it doesn't all get out of your system. Mm. So yeah, because yeah. of these factors, it takes about 20 minutes for you to actually feel how full you really are. Yeah. yeah. So a good concept is to kind of stop eating when you're no longer hungry, rather than to stop eating when you're full. Yeah. True that. And... This, we we think, is a big factor of uh, kind of preserving your health mm. because eating too much isn't good for you. Yeah. Now, that one's a pretty cool one. Then you get Sardinia. <laughs> there's a there's a mountain town in Sardinia called Ovoda, mm. and this one might seem a bit weird, but this mountain town is so secluded that people there are more inbred than the average population. Sure. Um, I can buy that. <laughs> yeah. So you can buy that, but you wouldn't buy it. <laughs> no. <laughs> Admire it from a distance. <laughs> yeah. Good from far, far from good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but actually it's not far from good because apparently uh, this kind of inbreeding to a certain extent does lead to, obviously it does lead to increased chances of getting certain genetic diseases. But if the genetic diseases aren't there in the first place, then inbreeding wouldn't necessarily contribute to... If, if basically inbreeding just creates, intensifies what you already have, genetically speaking, if you have a genetic pool that's like kind of free of serious diseases or, on the other hand, has genes that contribute to longer lifespan... Mm. All you're going to be doing is intensifying that yeah. if you just don't... If you that's, don't that's a very good point, yeah. ...introduce any change. That's a very good point. Well, then again, if you think about it, DNA isn't perfect and will always have little, little kind of faults. And if you give it enough time, it'll intensify sufficiently to actually manifest as mm. shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, makes sense. But So these people have something called G6PD deficiency, um, which 
you know, basically means that they can't eat things like fava beans or blueberries. Um, and if they do, they get these symptoms of kind of shortness of breath and fatigue, and even it can even lead to kidney damage and even death. Okay. But the trade-off, which I guess is, it depends on how much you love blueberries, <laughs> <laughs> is they do live longer, and it's not necessarily due to the G6B deficiency. We don't actually know exactly why they live longer, but they've mm-hmm. got they've got genes that kind of are associated with with healthy aging. Interesting. And obviously, they keep them within their their circles because of the sort of the inbreeding. Mm-hmm married or relatives to a certain extent so you know hats off to avoda <laughs> they and, cracked it they didn't even know it <laughs> and then now we go to america where there's a place in california called loma linda which i had never heard of before doing a bit of research on this mm. and they there's also a very high number of centenarians there and apparently this is a very religious community mm. and it's thought that the religion has something to do with it because uh, religion, especially in these kind of tight-knit communities, can lead to less kind of a lower degree of stress. Mm-hmm. Having a tight-knit community obviously means that you have high social cohesion. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they go to the church every Sunday, maybe more often than that. Everybody knows each other. And also, obviously, they don't smoke or drink. So these things are thought to contribute. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And if you have to live in one of these three, Mark, where would you go? I would definitely pick... The Sardinian. <laughs> the Sardinian I, Sardinian. I, I mean, just they, they would be so excited to see me. Like, <laughs> hey, so somebody new. Hey. Well, then again, they might not want you to follow their perfected gene pool. That's true. I'd be like a plague, <laughs> <laughs> genetic plague. Yeah, I don't know which one. I think I probably would choose Japan just because I think Japan is cool. Uh, but then again, uh, Sardinia has great food. <laughs> I'm going to try and sell it to you. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, from what we've discussed so far, Mark, is there anything that you think you'll change about how you live? I think the one, because I'm already like making moves towards like eating better and exercising more. I think the thing that I really need to focus on is um, what we were talking about before about the conscientiousness. So, focusing on one task at a yeah. time. I feel like I've, as a result of like different work habits that started to spiral in a negative way. And so while everything else is moving in a good direction, I need to make sure that I hold that back and don't let it get too out of control. Mm. Yep. Don't do too much multitasking. Mm. I think for me, um, one that I try and focus on is the sleep hygiene thing. Yeah. I do find myself often looking at a screen yeah. uh, before I go to bed. I think what I'm trying to do is shift more to reading. Uh, and reading when I mean when I say reading, I mean like reading a book or a Kindle, something that doesn't have a backlight. You sure. Know? Yeah. Um, they also say that regular naps prevent dying, kind of kind of old age, mm. especially if you do it during driving. I thought you said regular naps prevent dying. It's <laughs> <laughs> like wow, that's amazing. Uh, I think that joke flew over your head, didn't it? No. Was it wasn't. No, no, I was one. I was too busy listening to the first bit. I heard the second one. But I was yeah, just like, was, whoa, whoa, whoa. It, was, it just sounded silly. Because Slow down. <laughs> if regular maps are rented dying, that'd be. I think everybody would be. Thinking <laughs> I personally like. I just can't nap during the day. Yeah, it's difficult. I'm, I'm like an all sleep or nothing kind of guy. But if it prevents dying, <laughs> I think I'll make an effort. <laughs> all right, fine. I take it back. Yeah, some 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 of the interesting effects of aging as well that we. That I guess kind of many of us do know about, but it's interesting to just kind of go through. Yeah, is it starts as e- as early on as in your teenage years, where God, that's cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> teenagers lose the ability to hear above high frequencies, so mm-hmm. they lose their ability to hear anything with kind of twenty thousand hertz, which is something that children can hear. Yeah, which is why you used to have this thing of like um, kids in schools downloading apps that played very high frequency sounds that yes. the whole class could hear <laughs> except the teacher yeah and it kind of gradually got less popular when people kind of went into year eight year nine <laughs> so in their years when people realized hey wait a minute <laughs> i can't hear it either <laughs> it stops being fun it stops being it's fun. like a pointless app <laughs> <laughs> that stage. Yeah. it must be downloaded only by the kind of very young, young yeah. people, right yeah yeah I guess that that would be a good target, a good uh, a good one to do targeted advertising in. Yeah. So if you wanted to send to mess with your teacher, <laughs> like, would you also like to buy this product? <laughs> yeah. 
Well, that's how it happens, man. Yeah. Um, and uh, apparently in your mid twenties, you start to get cognitive decline. Right. So your brain <laughs> starts to great. <laughs> I just turned twenty five. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, if I'm, I'm also turning twenty five very soon, so if any of our welcome subsequent... to cognitive <laughs> decline. <laughs> If our subsequent episodes start to get less good, <laughs> you can you know them. why. <laughs> just love uh, losing our minds. Yeah. So, um, yeah, another one, obviously, is wrinkles, which happen largely due to photo-aging. So UV radiation yeah. is the, the thing that most contributes to wrinkles. How does it do that, though? Because, I mean, I would have figured that... Is it like the effect of the light on your skin actually causes it, like the the cells, mm. to warp into like a wrinkled end result? Mm. Uh, in a way, so what it does is the UV radiation affects your DNA, mm. and by messing with the, anything that messes with the DNA, like is <laughs> is gonna, is, is gonna <laughs> give you a bad time. No good. <laughs> yeah. So that's wrinkles for you. Um, now for ladies. In your mid twenties, your fertility will start to decline, mm -hmm. uh, and it kind of peaks. That's kind of when it peaks in your mid kind of twenties, a little bit less than that, and then it starts to decline after that. And uh, obviously, uh, the menopause tends to occur between the ages of forty nine and fifty two, mm -hmm. on average. Mm -hmm. I've heard uh, that apparently, the word menopause stems from the fact that many ladies, when they enter that age, they get many cats and it's many paws. <laughs> oh, sure. You keep coming up with these zingers, man. Hey, we did say you have to sound cool at parties, so we've got to live up to that. Uh, uh, but in all seriousness, so, in the so with regards to menopause um, and fertility, uh, girls are born with about one to two million egg cells. Mm. And they never make any new ones yeah. after they're born. In fact, they decline pretty quickly. So when they reach puberty, there's about 300,000 left of those millions. Million. And by the time... What's been happening to those eggs in the meantime? Do they just like deteriorate? <laughs> uh, yeah, many of them just don't mature. Um, I don't know the specifics, actually, but I'm guessing they just get... They just die off or something. I'm Interesting. Not sure Damn. And, what a shame. Uh, yeah. Well, what a shame. I know. Well, it's just like you have all that, those, that many to start off with. Yeah. And then, you know, by the time you get to puberty, like most of them yeah. aren't. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think anybody really ever plans on having 300,000 children. Well, yeah. But I mean, <laughs> it would mean that your menopause would be put off for longer mm -hmm. if you had yeah. more eggs. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's a limiting factor. I mean, it's true. Basically, by the, by the time your menopause comes around, you have zero eggs left. Yeah. Um, but I don't think having more eggs would necessarily pro kind of deter the menopause or... or yeah, no, it's, it's like, it's There's the... other factors. Like what came first, the menopause or the egg? <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey! Okay, yeah. Okay, I think, you, I think you've topped my thing there, Mark. <laughs> um, so, there's only a small percentage of eggs that actually um, end up maturing. Mm. Uh, and it's only about 400 of them, actually, that are released over the reproductive cycle. Um, and if you think about it, so not, not really any... So one egg, classically, is lost every time that a woman has, you know, every time she menstruates. Mm. That's generally once one cycle. Um, so you only got 400 of those. So I think on average, that means that the average woman will have 400 periods over mm. her lifetime until she reaches the menopause. That is an interesting fact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another aspect of aging is hair. So we're quite focused on hair in terms of aging. So there's two things, obviously, gray, gray hair. Yeah. So the classic thing that people say is that once, when people turn 50, 50% 50 of those will have grayed hair that makes up 50% of their entire hair. Okay. 50, 50 rule. Yeah. So, um, that kind of holds true. Um, I thought it happened sooner, to be honest. I mean, you'll start having, it'll start happening sooner, yeah. but f half of your hair will by be the time you get to 50, by the time you get to 50 for half of people. Yeah. Uh, although 
apparently many people when they start seeing grey hair they would rather die yeah <laughs> oh. <laughs> God damn it, man. hey I didn't mean die as in, as in pass away they'd rather just die everything <laughs> my hair is grey my life is over um <laughs> in terms of uh, obviously the other thing associated with hair is loss so by um in the time that you reach 50 years old, uh, hair loss will start to affect around 40% of males and about a quarter of females. Mm. Yeah, I can buy that. Yeah. Uh, there's always hair implants, people, or uh, you can just get all your hair lasered off and then you're just a, a cue ball. Yeah, you get a wig. <laughs> get a wig. Wigs used to be fashionable a long, long time ago. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, but... That's because everyone had, like, lice. Yeah. So they shaved their hair off and replaced yeah. it with a wig, which would deter that. Well, that's the benefits of uh, having a historian with you. Yeah, no, history. He knows this great. shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, apparently being very fair-skinned was a, used to be a kind of a sign of high society. Yeah, and the reason for that was that um, you, if you had very fair skin, it was presumed that you weren't spending a lot of time out in the fields working. Busting your ass. Exactly. Yeah. Which, so basically, all the peasants were tanned and mm -hmm. high society wasn't. And that's where, because like, even today, I'd say like, fair skin is considered to be like, more beautiful in many cases. But nowadays, people who are tanned are often seen as like, more successful because they can travel. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, they have money to, to go on holiday. I was going to say, who's laughing now? Like, now <laughs> the tanned people are the ones that rule the world. <laughs> basically. And some, also, people, some people with fake tans. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> mm. I still don't know what that what's up with that guy's hair. Apparently he takes uh, a drug that uh, kind of stops you losing hair. Mm. Also, can we talk, the, given that we're talking about aging, can yeah. we talk about how old he is? He's like, yeah. in his, I don't want to. 70, is he? He's, he's in his 70s. I don't know if it's like the late end of the 70s or anything yeah. like that. He's one of America's, if not the oldest president. Mm. I don't know. I don't know how people, like, if I was that age, I don't think I could hack being yeah. the president. Yeah. I'd be a lot of, uh, as you were saying, chronic stress. Yeah. Maybe you just <laughs> go, maybe you just go golfing a lot. Yeah. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. That doesn't help us at all. Um, yeah. And uh, speaking of Donald Trump, uh, dementia <laughs> <laughs> also happens with aging. Um, and obviously, when I say dementia, it, it involves a kind of a spectrum of kind of mild cognitive impairment all the way through to kind of the severe uh, kind of the types of dementia. Yeah. Um, so between the ages of 65 to 74, 3% of the population will be affected by dementia. At some point on the spectrum, yeah. not like, so not three percent will be affected by severe dementia. No, exactly. We'll be somewhere on the spectrum. Got yeah. it. Uh, when the ages of seventy-eight to eighty-four, that number pops out up to nineteen percent. Damn. And when you're eighty-five plus, almost half of all people will have a degree of cognitive impairment. That is rough. I guess yeah. In a way, maybe it's it could be considered normal. Um, the interesting thing is that w the type of de that dementia or cognitive impairment is quite specific in the sense that it involves many kinds of memory loss, mm -hmm. except for something called semantic memory. And semantic memory is kind of is basically general knowledge. Yeah. So the kind of memory that th they would lose is well, the kind of memory that they would keep is they would know that Paris is the capital of France, but they wouldn't remember a trip they took to Paris with their family. Exactly. Yeah, that is well, that's called episodic memory. Yeah, yeah, that's a shame. Better, well, then better, also... it, better it be the other way around. Yeah, mm, yeah. Well, then, then they would be like, hmm, "Where, where did we go again? What was that place?" <laughs> I just remember, but I just remember it was great. It was great. That's so... all that matters. <laughs> yeah. Um. So apparently, exercise specifically is very good at staving off dementia. And the theory is that, you know, exercising, which will make your heart obviously pump more, will pump more blood up to your brains because, mm -hmm. you know, you can't, you can't really select where the blood goes when you pump it. Yeah. So obviously it'll go to your muscles and everything, but also to your brain. And that apparently works wonders. Yeah. 
No, I can see that, because it basically just, like, makes sure that every possible nook and cranny of your brain gets more blood more constantly. Yeah. Which means that there's no chance that any part of it would lapse. Yeah. Yeah. Clock out. Yeah. So, the other thing that is interesting about exercise is we mentioned those two kinds of exercise, right? The, the HIT and the kind of moderate cardiovascular exercise. Now, weightlifting, which I think many people might be wondering about, actually lifting weights, um, generally isn't considered to really impact your telomeres much. So if you only go to the gym to lift weights, yeah, there might be a certain benefit, but it's not really as significant as what you, you get from cardiovascular. You will end up old, but ripped. <laughs> <laughs> but still old. Yeah, but hey, I guess there's worse things in life. No. Uh, now, w the reason that cardiovascular, or sorry, weightlifting is very good is because um, it keeps your bone density high. Mm. You know? Yeah. Probably something that happens with aging. Your bone yeah. is thin. So probably the best thing would be to do a bit of both. So, what is the most interesting thing that you think you'll take away from this? I think it's going to have to go back to the to the conscientiousness, right? Mm. Because I want something that will be like very practical, something that I can like immediately start thinking about and start to change to contribute towards this. Yeah. At the same time, going I guess right back to the beginning of what we were talking about. Mm. You know, for a lot of this, we're not really talking about aging. We're talking about youthfulness yeah. and how much of that comes down to telomeres mm. and then, like, changes in your genetics. Yeah. So, you know, as much as, like, the lifestyle changes and that sort of thing will help, then clearly the, the long-term solution, if you want to call it that, will be genetic science. Mm. Like, will there be ways that you can, like, physically alter... Mm your genes, your telomeres, yeah. through what could be like a surgery or something yeah. like that, um, that will help keep you youthful in the long run. That's an interesting point. So there is something that, okay, it's not surgery, but there's been there's been thinking of uh, influencing your telomeres with injections. So yeah. telomeres, uh, to kind of understand this, you got to know about something called the Hayflick limit. Now, the Hayflick limit uh, is named after a guy called something Hayflick. Mr. Mr. Limit. Mr. <laughs> Limit. <laughs> Hayflick was his first name. <laughs> Hayflick Limit. Pretty cool name. Yeah. Um, so this guy like did experiments with cells, and he realized that most types of cells in the human body um, age, uh, and they show that by not dividing anymore. So mm -hmm. any cell in the body has, the, or almost any cell in the body, has the ability to divide. Yeah. And after a certain number of replications, the cells get kind of worn out or tired. And that number is around 50. So 50 is what's called the Hayflick limit. But sure, this is like a, a, like a very broad average, right? No, so that's so it's average in the sense that most cells have this limit. Right, okay, because like the, the stomach lining cells exactly, definitely don't. Exactly, so certain cells don't have that limit. Um, why not? Because they have something called telomerase. Mm. Right. So what happens as cells divide is their telomeres get shorter with each division yeah. until they reach this period of senescence where they can no longer divide and the telomeres are very short. Now, certain cells like stomach lining cells, hair cells, skin cells, the cells that divide a lot have telomerase. Telomerase rebuilds the telomeres the back up. Yeah. Exactly. So people were thinking, huh. Here's something that maybe the pharmaceutical companies obviously thought maybe this is something that we can make tons can and tons of money with. from. <laughs> so they saw their, their eyes went like dollar signs, you know, yeah. like seen the cartoons. So, but unfortunately, we don't really understand how telomeres work. So, experiments <laughs> of that must have been a huge frustration for them. <laughs> so, don't go on Google or on Amazon and try and buy tel telomerase <laughs> and inject yourself with it because, because it will um, not be telomerase <laughs> and it will probably be something terrible. <laughs> Even if it is telomerase, it, do it doesn't really work in that way. Yeah. Um, in fact, it can be dangerous because allowing cells to divide without a limit is essentially what happens in cancer. Yeah. So cancer cells are mutated to the extent that they, are, they no longer have a Hayflick limit and they grow uncontrollably. And that's the issue with cancer. Has, so, any, has anyone studied the telomeres of cancerous cells? Um, I'm sure that 
I'm sure it has been studied. Yeah, because think... maybe, maybe there's something to the fact that cells are cancerous, because if that means that their telomeres stop reducing, there could be an element of that. I'm not saying give people cancer to stop <laughs> aging. It's <laughs> a contradiction in terms. Yeah. But there could be something from the cancerous cells that could be extracted and then applied in yeah. a controlled setting. So in a way, we have that. So we have stem cells, and the stem cells also don't have a limit to how, how often they can divide. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's definitely a promising area. Do you have anything else to add? Leave it that. I think I'm all chatted out at this point. Cool. That was well, good. Uh, let's see what. Um, let's see what the next session brings. What the next session brings. Yeah, we're open to ideas. Nice. Mark and Sharif out. <laughs> see you later.